Good morning. We're glad to offer the uh, worship this morning, a live stream for our members. And if you're visiting with us, we're glad that you're with us also. Uh, I would like to take a few minutes for our members just to mention a few to keep in prayers. Um, first of all, uh, congratulations are due for Drew and Morgan Dulaney on the birth of their son, Archie Britt Dulaney. He was born Thursday, April the 16th, weighed seven pounds seven ounces and 21 inches long and mom and baby are doing well and grandparents are doing well too uh, we want to keep in prayer uh, the, the uh, continue to keep in prayer the sisters of jennifer glass who are recovering from automobile accident one of the sisters is in rehab now and one has been discharged so that's good news uh, jim gray uh, has been diagnosed with lung cancer uh, so we want to Pray for him and continually pray for Jim and his family. Gregor, Gregory Liddell would like to thank the congregation for the cards and calls uh, during the passing of his mother. He called me and was appreciative of all the actions the congregation has taken. So uh, we thank Gregory for that, for that note. Let's keep Wayne Morris and Betty in our prayers as he's continued to be in the hospital, hopefully to get out pretty soon, but he's still in the hospital with pneumonia and slight kidney problems, so let's keep them in our prayers. Scott McAlpin, the brother-in-law of Heather Morris, had heart surgery on Tuesday, uh, so keep uh, them in your prayers. Also continue to keep Stacy Rutland, the daughter of Jimmy and Mary, uh, in your prayers also after her surgery. Let's uh, continue to pray for those in Fiji that have, were affected by the, the uh, tropical cyclone that they had there, uh, and also uh, in our state, those that were affected by the tornadoes on, on last Sunday. So uh, just keep all these in, our, in your prayers that we've mentioned this morning. Uh, and uh, just a, a note, we hope very soon to be able to uh, to gather back together as a congregation to worship our Lord together face to face. Uh, it's looking a little bit better out there uh, uh, from what we're hearing from the governor and things like that. So we look forward to that day very, very uh, soon. Um, so as we prepare our minds to worship this morning, let's bow our heads together and pray. Our Father in heaven, we are so grateful for your love for us, Father. We're grateful for the time that we can honor you this morning, that we can worship you in spirit and in truth, Father. We pray that as we worship this morning, our minds will now be focused on the songs that we sing together for the Lord's Supper that we will partake of in a moment that will honor and glorify your Son who died on the cross for our sins, Father. Father, that we will remember to give back to you in a way that shows that we love you and care for your church, Father. Father, we do ask that you would be with all those that I have mentioned who are ill or sick or recovering, Father. We particularly pray for Jim Gray uh, and the treatments that he will be undergoing and pray for his comfort, Father. We pray for Wayne and Betty Mars, and Wayne as he's in the hospital, and Betty as she will uh, continually take care of him, whether in the hospital or coming home, Father. And we pray that you would help him to continually get better, Father. Father, again, we love you. We thank you so much for your church. Father, we pray, continue to pray for our nation as we're going through this virus ordeal, Father. We pray that it will be over very, very soon. Father, we're thankful for... The positive words we're beginning to hear about being able to come together again, Father, and we pray that that will be the case very, very soon. Father, again, we love you and thank you for the opportunity to worship you this morning. Help us to honor you and worship you with our minds focused on you this morning. Is our prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning. Our first hymn for this morning will be page 148. 148. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. We we'll sing verses 1 and 3. We all have it. They will sing. Hallelujah. Praise Jehovah. From the heavens, praise his name. 
Praise Jehovah in the highest. All his angels praise proclaim. All his hosts together praise him. Sun and moon and stars on high. Praise him, O ye heaven of heaven, and ye floods above the sky. Let them praise his good Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. All ye fruitful trees and cedars, all ye hills and mountains high, creeping things and beasts and cattle, birds that in the heavens fly, kings of earth and all ye people, princes, grand earth, judges all. Praise his name, young men and maidens, aged men and children small. Let them praise his good Jehovah, for his name alone is high. And his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted, and his glory is exalted far above the earth and sky. A hymn before communion will be page 557. Hymn 557. We'll be singing verses 1 and 3. There is a fountain. Can we all have it? Maybe sing. There is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunge beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. This morning, before we begin our communion, I will be reading from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, beginning in verse 23. For I have received of the Lord, that which I also deliver to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let us pray. Father God, we are so thankful, Father, that you submitted yourself to this life, Father, that you 
gave your body so freely, Father, for each and every one of us, Father. Father, as we partake of this bread that represents that body, Father, we pray that we take in a melon that's well pleasing in your sight. In your name we do humbly pray. Amen. Let us continue in verse 25. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death till he comes. Therefore, whosoever eats this bread and drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself. And so let him eat of this bread and drink of this cup, for he who eats and drinks in an unworthy manner eats and drinks judgment to himself, not discerning the Lord's body. Let us pray. Father God, we thank you so much, Father, for your life that you gave up on the cross of Calvary, Father. Father, we thank you for the blood that, you, that came forth, Father, that hit the ground, Father. Father, we thank you for that blood that saved us from all our sins, Father. Father, as we partake of this cup now that represents that blood, Father, we pray that we take in a manner that's well pleasing in your sight. In your name we do humbly pray. Amen. At this time, uh, we normally have an offering at this time. Uh, there will be more information given to you at the end of the service, but let's pray for the offering. Father God, we thank you so much for the blessings you continue to bestow upon us, Father. Father, we thank you for the means that you allow us to work, and to live, Father, and the things you let us provide for ourselves, Father, through your, through your will, Father. Father, we thank you now that we, as we give back now a portion that you have so richly blessed us with, Father, we pray that we will give it, Father, with a cheerful heart. It's your name we do humbly pray. Amen. The next election will be page 312. And 312. We'll be singing verses 1 and 3. I have a we sing. Brightly beams our Father's mercy from his light house evermore. But to us he gives the keeping of the light along the shore. Let the Lord lights be burning. Send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fang, taste struggling seaman. You may rescue, you may save. Trim your feet, bull and my brother. Some poor sailor tempest tossed. Trying now to make the harbor in the darkness may be lost. Let the Lord lights be burning, send a gleam across the wave. Some poor fang, taste struggling seaman. You may rescue, you may save. Thank you.
Hello and welcome to our worship service for Sunday, April the 19th, 2020. Once again, it's a joy to be able to, to interact with you in this way, and yet it's a greater joy that hopefully is not too far in the future when we'll be gathered together again. Please take advantage of these videos, which by the way, we post every week. Even when we're all meeting here together, we have a live that is archived. When you hear something that you think a friend might benefit from, send it out to them, share it, share it on Facebook, make comments about the video that we have on Facebook. Uh, that will increase the number of folks that see what we're doing. We want to do everything we can to impact the world for our Lord Jesus Christ. You know, there's a temptation in times like this to, to think, well, we can't really do anything. We'll just, we'll just sit down and, and we'll wait. But the reality is that the Christian life is likened in Scripture to a race. And we've got to be running the race all the time. The writer of the letter to the Hebrew Christians of the first century talked about that very fact. He'd already been discussing the, the Hebrews of old, the ones who left the land of Egypt with Moses, uh, the people who, who saw those marvelous miracles, and yet, because they didn't trust God, they did not get to enter into the promised land. The writer doesn't want these Christians to end up in the same place. And so when he gets to chapter 12, he talks about running the race. And the very first thing that he helps us to see is to get ready to run, some things must be cast aside. J just imagine for a moment that we're about to run a race. And imagine that all of us come, you know, wearing... Uh, some light apparel, you know, something not too heavy, maybe a, a t-shirt, uh, uh, maybe a, a, a light pair of, of pants and a, a good light pair of running shoes. And then along comes uh, someone, uh, you know, like Kyle, and he's in, he's in full gear. He's got all that marine apparatus that he would have, you know, the backpack and the, and the weapon and, and all the other things he's carrying. And we're going to run for a mile. Who do you think is going to win the race? Well, Kyle might because he's in better shape than the rest of us, but it won't be because he had the easier run. Running with all that gear is probably going to slow him down, and I'll imagine that some of our young men and young women would outrun him because they would be unencumbered. The writer understands that, and so listen to him at the very beginning of chapter 12. Therefore, we also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight. Let us lay aside every weight. What, what kind of weights do you suppose he could be talking about? I think some of the weights that Jesus talks about come as a bit of a surprise. At least they do to me. Uh, look at, for example, Matthew chapter 10, uh, verses 37 and 38, where Jesus says, He who loves father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he who loves son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he who does not take his cross and follow after me is not worthy of me. He who finds his life will lose it. And he who loses his life for my sake will find it. Now, summarize those verses in, in just the language you and I would use. And here's what I come up with. Don't love your mom and dad. Don't love your wife. Don't love your children. Don't even love yourself more than you love Jesus. Now, pause just a minute. He didn't say don't love those people, including yourself. What he's saying is, I want the top spot. And the ultimate reality is, if I really love Jesus, I'm going to give a better form of love to my parents and my spouse and my children and everybody else for that matter. 
But when we let family take the top spot and push Jesus out of it, then running the Christian race is going to be much, much more difficult. Go back to the book of Hebrews. We're in chapter 6, verse 12. He talks about another weight that we need to cast aside. Here he writes that you do not become sluggish, but imitate those who through faith and patience inherit the promises. I don't know about you, but I've discovered about myself that if I, I spend a day where I really don't try to do anything, I just sit back or, or maybe I, I lay in bed a little bit longer than normal, I, I find that I'm sluggish. In fact, I sometimes even get a headache from just laying around doing nothing. I don't do that well, but... Once it starts that way, it's very difficult to get out of that rut and go in any other direction. Here the writer is warning us we've got to lay aside the weight of the love of ease. Too many people have come to the belief that it's a false belief, but they've come to it anyway. A belief that says, you know what, I believed the word of God. I repented of my sins. I confess Jesus as my Lord and the Son of God. And I put him on in baptism, all of which are things we must do, as is easily demonstrated in John 3.16 and in uh, Luke chapter 13, verses 3 and 5, and in, in Matthew chapter 10, verses 32 and 33, and in Acts chapter 2, verse 38. There's no doubt we've got to do those things. But we hear that when we are baptized for the remission of our sins, we hear that those sins are done away with, and we think, well, good, I can just sit down now. And that's not it at all. In fact, the apostle John, in writing the book of 1 John, says that that we've got to walk in the light. And the words that he uses there literally mean keep on walking. I've got to lay aside the love of ease. It'll hold me back. Anything, in other words, that stands between me really loving Jesus like I ought to and where I am now, I need to get rid of it. I need to lay that weight aside. But there's another weight that the writer talks about. He goes ahead and says, and the sin which so easily ensnares us. The word ensnares there is one that as I read it and read the definitions, here's what I think about. I I think about uh, some really fast fellow, let's say modern era Olympics, maybe Usain Bolt. I mean, the fastest man on the face of the earth, so they say. So imagine him for just a minute. He's coming into a race, and, and as you see him walk in, you think, this is different. He is wearing a maxi skirt. And not just a maxi skirt. I mean, it is one that's a little bit snug fitting. So they tell them, get ready. And he tries to bend down. He can't even really bend and get in the blocks like he ought to. And then finally the gun goes off and people start to run. And as he tries to take that first big stride, down he goes. That maxi skirt binds him and he just falls. Well, the imagery the writer uses here is just like that. Sin is like trying to run a sprint in a maxi skirt. And it's just really not possible. We've got to put it aside. In the book of 2 Corinthians chapter 6, I believe that's what Paul is talking about in part. When beginning in verse 17, he says, Therefore, come out from among them and be separate, says the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. I will be a father to you, and you shall be my sons and daughters says the Lord Almighty. Therefore, having these promises, beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. You hear what he's saying? Get rid of sin. Why? Because it will keep you from being close to God. It'll keep you from really enjoying the blessings of his fatherhood, if you would. We've got to lay aside sin. In that Ephesian epistle, 
the Apostle Paul, particularly in chapter 4, deals with these very matters. And he deals with it in a series of verses. Only one is on your outline, but, but pick up with me, if you will, from verse 25 of Ephesians 4 and hear what he says. Therefore, putting away lying, let each one of you speak truth with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. So the first sin I've got to get rid of in this list is lying. Then he goes on. Be angry and do not sin. Do not let the sun go down on your wrath, nor give place to the devil. I've got to look out. If I let my anger get out of control, the devil's got a hold of me. And boy, sin is definitely in my life. Then he goes ahead. Let him who stole steal no longer, but rather let him labor, working with his hands what is good, that he may have something to give to him who has need. I've got to quit stealing if I was a thief. When I become a Christian, that sin's got to be put aside. And then, verse 29, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. You hear him? I've got to put away corrupt communication. That's rank, foul. Just imagine something, oh, it's... Ooh, it doesn't smell good at all. Well, to God, my filthy mouth doesn't smell good. I've got to put that sin aside if I really want to be able to compete in this race that we're talking about. If I want to be able to do that, I've got to lay aside the weight of anything that gets a top spot above Christ and also the sin. But then the writer goes on and he says, to complete the race, we must have endurance. Endurance is a, an important part of running any race. And we're, we're really not talking about a sprint. You know, most anybody <laughs> can run a sprint. Most of us, if if we were given the opportunity, could complete a mile, but I didn't say run, notice. That would be difficult. Uh, the sprint, not too bad. The mile, that's, uh, you know, that, that gets to be quite a race that we're talking about. When the writer of Hebrews talks about this race, he is, he's envisioning something more like a marathon, not, not even a mile. He's talking about a marathon, 26.2 miles or something. In other words, it goes on your whole life. And so listen to him as he continues at the end of verse 1 of chapter 12 of Hebrews. And he says, let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. I, I've seen, I love watching the Olympics. Some of you already know that. And I, I've seen them when they want uh, some fella to have the potential of, let's say, breaking the record for the mile run. They'll put in what they call a rabbit or maybe a couple of rabbits. And these are fellas that are really good sprinters, and they can run that first quarter mile faster than probably than the guy that's the really good miler. But they go out and set that pace, and they challenge that miler to run a little bit faster in that opening quarter mile. And if it works like it ought to, he's going to come home with a faster time. Well, we are not sprinters. We, we've got to have the endurance of the fellow that goes all the way to the end of the mile or all the way to the end of the marathon. Now, most anybody can start one. Can you finish it? My answer would be, how many days are you going to give me? <laughs> I'm not sure if I can finish it or not. But we've got to have endurance to make it to the end. In Hebrews chapter 10, uh, we notice that the writer in verses 35 and 36 uh, talks about something that, that would seem to help us here. Here's what he writes. Therefore, do not cast away your confidence, which has great reward, for you have need of endurance, so that after you've done the will of God, you may receive the promise. The sad truth is, and he's already talked about it. For example, in chapter 3, he spoke about it in, the, in this book of Hebrews. The, the Hebrew people left the land of Egypt with powerful con confidence. They, they were leaving behind all that torturous slavery that they'd been a part of. They were going to a promised land, a land flowing with milk and honey. They had that to look forward to. 
The problem was, though, that, that, that their endurance that just didn't last. I mean, you look at the book of Exodus and see they're barely out of the land of Egypt. They're barely across the Red Sea before they start to complain, well, where's the water? We don't have anything to drink. And then it's, well, where's the meat? You know, we're used to having meat back in Egypt. We, we, all, we didn't ever have any idea that we were going to get, and what does it cost them? It costs them the promised land. They didn't endure. They didn't remain faithful. They didn't continue to rely upon the God who had delivered them by a powerful hand. We need to take the warning from them. And that's what the writer of Hebrews is saying. We've got to endure. We've got to keep on in this Christian life if we really want to enjoy our promised land, which is not an earthly land flowing with milk and honey. Oh, no, it's heaven. It's where God is. And oh, what a joy it will be to be there. We want to hang on. Isn't that exactly what Paul says? Philippians chapter 2, verse 16, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. <clears throat> that word vain describes a, an emptiness, no prize. You know, what, what good is it to run a race if you don't get the prize? You know, the that's what everybody's goal is, at least, is to receive the prize. Well, in Paul's case, he, he viewed his work among the Philippian brethren, and I would suggest probably in any place where he went, he viewed that as, as a thing that he hoped to rejoice in. And the real rejoicing would come when he, when he could stand in the day of judgment and see those people that he taught entering in being bidden to come in as faithful servants. And so he says, hold on. And that's what we've got to do. Times can be rough. Life can be difficult. We can be going through trials, but hold on because heaven is just ahead. In Philippians chapter 3, Paul describes himself and the way he approached it, beginning at verse 12, when he writes this. Not that I have already attained. Now stop just a minute. He's saying, I haven't gotten to the finish line yet. So you're going to see the persistence in everything that he says here, I think. The endurance is right here. Not that I've already attained or am already perfected, but I press on that I may lay hold of that for which Christ Jesus has also laid hold of me. Brethren, I do not count myself to have apprehended but one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forward to those things which are ahead, I press toward the goal for the prize of the upward call of God in Christ Jesus. If we're putting this in, in modern running terms, Paul is saying, I'm not going to quit till I break the tape, till I cross the finish line. That's my goal. You've got to constantly keep in mind we're not there yet. Oh, we're on the road. That's our goal. We're on the path. We're in the race. We haven't quit. We haven't sat down. We're continuing on, but we've got to keep continuing on until we totally complete this race that is before us. We've got to endure. And then the writer of Hebrews says, to finish well, we must keep our eyes on Jesus. Listen to him now in verse 2 where of Hebrews chapter 12 where he says, looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and is sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Looking unto Jesus. Uh, there are a lot of ways I think that we could illustrate the importance of, of looking at Jesus who is ahead of us. Uh, uh, <clears throat> you just take, if you're mowing a, a long stretch, uh, if you want to mow straight, how do you do that? Well, I can tell you how you don't do it. You don't look down right in front of the lawnmower. I mean, yes, you have to know whether there's a, a rock or, or something else in the way. You should survey that before you start. But if you want to 
mow a straight line so that it's easier to go back and forth, then you've got to set your sights out there on something way out ahead. And you've got to keep your eyes there and walk straight to it. And then you'll see that pretty much you've gone in a straight line. The beauty of what the writer of Hebrews lets us know about this race is Jesus has already made it. He's the author and finisher. He's completed the race. He's in heaven. He's where we want to be. Keep your eyes on him. The character in scripture that I think serves as a warning to us is the apostle Peter. Peter often had his eyes on Jesus. He's often the first one to speak when Jesus asks a question. He's often the first one to respond when Jesus has a need. But when he got out of that boat to walk on the water, he was able to walk toward Jesus until he took his eyes off him. You ever notice that? When he began to notice the, the boisterous waves and the wind all around him, when he took his eyes off of Jesus, then he started to sink. And we need to be aware because our lives can be the same. As we look at, at Jesus, we need to realize he's made it. And we can too. In the book of Titus, chapter 2, Paul writes to one of his uh, young protégés, as it were, a young preacher. And as he does so in chapter 2, verses 12 and 13, here's what he tells him. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in the present age, looking for the blessed hope and glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. Keep doing what you're doing until you see Jesus coming. That is a marvelous image. There's a sense in which, not literally, but figuratively, Christians ought to always have their eyes set on the heavens. One day, he's coming in the clouds. There's going to be a trumpet sound, there's going to be the, the shout, the voice of the archangel. And when all of that takes place, we will, if we've endured to the end, if we've kept on and we kept our eyes focused on the Lord, we will go home. And now, the writer of Hebrews does not picture this <clears throat> as being a simple walk that has no dangers in the past. In fact, even when he looks at Jesus in chapter 12, verse 3, <clears throat> he says it this way. For consider him who endured such hostility from sinners against himself, lest you become weary and discouraged in your souls. Now, first of all, think about Jesus. The, the very people he came to save, many of them violently opposed him. It was a contradictory concept. He was their savior, but they, they rejected him. They crucified him. He endured a true contradiction of sinners. So he's not saying here that we're not going to have any troubles uh, far from that. Instead, he says, don't, don't be weary. Don't get sick of all this stuff. And don't get discouraged. Don't get exhausted by all this stuff. Why not? Because Jesus is still just ahead. He's just ahead. Keep your eyes on him. You can make it. When the Apostle Paul wrote to the brethren of Galatia, he, he spoke to them about some of these very ideas. In Galatians chapter 5, verse 7, listen to him as he makes a statement, and then he asks a question that I think all of us need to be Careful to ask, do I need to ask myself that question? Here's what he said. You ran well. Who hindered you from obeying the truth? Every Christian started out well. I know that because they're a Christian. I know that they've repented. I know they've confessed. I know they've put on Christ in baptism. They've done all of that. They did begin the race well. Who or what is hindering us from keeping on in our service? In Galatians chapter 6, just one chapter over, verse 9, Paul says, And let us not grow weary in well-doing, for in due season 
We shall reap if we faint not. I've gotten to be around a lot of farmers in my lifetime. And the thing that I've observed about farmers is that they plant today and the crop doesn't come up tomorrow. They plant today and the crop doesn't come up next week or even next month. It may be two or three months on down the road before that harvest begins, begins to be had. And they've just got to patiently wait. James talks about that in his little epistle as well, how that they patiently wait for the early and the latter rains. We've got to be more like a farmer. We can't be the microwave society when it comes to Christianity. We've got to be people who keep our eyes focused on the goal, never take them off until we reach the end. We're running a very important race. It's a marathon. It's all of life. In order to do it, we must lay aside certain things. We must endure all the way to the end. Keep on keeping on. And in order to achieve both of those things, we've got to keep our eyes on Jesus. He's in heaven. That's where all of us want to be too. next election will be out of our folders B83 B83 do you know my Jesus oh have to make me sing have you a heart that's weary tending a load of care are you a soul that's seeking Rest from the burden you bear. Do you know, my Jesus? Do you know, my friend? Have you heard he loves you and that he will abide to the your disappointments who hear each time you cry who understands your heartaches who dries the tears from your eyes do you know my Jesus do you know my friend, have you heard he loves you and that he will abide to the end? Good morning. We want to thank you all for worshiping with us today. We are so glad you decided to join with us online this morning, and we long for the day that we all can be together again very soon. This morning, if anyone has any prayer requests, please let one of us know. We would love the opportunity to pray for you. You can contact the elders, the ministers, or you can contact the church office throughout the week. The contact information for the church office is on the screen at this time. Please send us an email, give us a phone call. We would love the opportunity to pray for you. We would also love the opportunity to have a Bible study with you. So if you're interested in setting up a Bible study, please also let us know. Free Bible study by mail is also available at this time. If you would like a Bible study sent to your home, please let the church office know and we will get one sent out to you as soon as possible. When we look into the word of God, we see the good news of Jesus. We see that Jesus Christ came to earth, that he died on the cross for our sins, that he rose on the third day. We also see what God has told us that, that we need to do in order to be saved. And so we, we hear that word and we believe it. We, we see that within the word that, that we are all sinners and that we've all fallen short of the glory of God. We see the need to repent, to change our lives for him, to confess Jesus, to confess that he's the son of God, that he's the savior of all. 
You see, without Jesus, it is impossible to get to the Father. We see the need within Scripture to be baptized for the remission of our sins, washing our sins away. And when we come up out of the water, we are to live a new life for him faithfully. This morning, if you're outside of Christ and you want to set up, set up a Bible study to study about what you need to do to be saved, please let one of us know. If you are in Christ, but you have found yourself walking again uh, in sin and the ways of the world, we would also love to pray for you this time, love to study with you, love to help in any way that we can. Once again, we are so glad you decided to worship with us this morning. As was mentioned earlier in our services, the opportunity to give is, is available at this time. You can mail your contribution to the church office throughout the week, or you can, uh, through the link provided on the screen, uh, submit your contribution electronically. We thank you once again for worshiping with us today. As we conclude our worship this morning, let us go to God in prayer. Our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for this day, for all that you've done for us. The Lord, at this time, there are many people that are sick and that are hurting. And we, the Lord, we ask if you be your will for you to, to heal them, uh, to give them comfort, the Lord, as only you can. The Lord, we ask you to be with your church. The Lord, help strengthen us. The Lord, help uh, give us courage and boldness to go out to the world and proclaim the gospel. The Lord, we have many at this time that have lost loved ones, the Lord. And we ask you to be with them, to be with their families, the Lord, and, and to help them in all the ways that you can. To help us as a family of God to, to love our brothers and sisters in Christ and to be there for them uh, through everything. The Lord, we ask you that f for those of us that, uh, that sometimes stumble and that we fall, the Lord, to, to help us to, to see the error of our ways, the Lord, and to continually come back to you uh, when we fall short. The Lord, we ask you to guide, guard, and protect us and help us through this day. And in Christ's name we pray. Amen.